In this homework, we'll write a program to calculate the capacity dimension of the trajectory of a dynamical system. For simplicity, for this video, we'll focus on the two-dimensional case, but later in the more advanced version of the homework, you'll work in the n-dimensional case. The first step in this process is to write a program to calculate the number of boxes needed of a side length epsilon needed to cover an object. To do this, we'll cover the object with a grid. These are the gray dots you see in the right picture. Each one of these squares is epsilon by epsilon wide. In your code, you don't actually want to build this grid every time. The grid is simply there as a visual for understanding this algorithm. What we want to do is have a matrix where each index in the matrix is mapped to one element in this grid. So for example, the grid element in the upper left would be mapped to the matrix element 1, 1. This chunk of code sets up such a matrix. We then simply need to walk over the trajectory and map each element in the trajectory to one of these positions in the matrix, and then activate that element in the matrix. In the video, you'll see new black stars appearing. Each black star corresponds to the next point in the trajectory. We will then use this map, which takes the current element minus the minimum in that direction divided by epsilon and takes the ceiling of that. That'll map that element of the trajectory to an index in the matrix. We then simply need to activate that element in the matrix. That is, we simply need to set the entry in the matrix at that index equal to one. In the video, this is shown as the grayed out boxes being activated by red. So just for a visual mapping, the black stars are being mapped by this mapping to a position in the box matrix, and then entry at that index in the matrix is being set equal to one, and this is equivalent to the red boxes appearing. Once we've gone through the entire trajectory, we'll see something like this. Here, the trajectory has been covered by the minimum number of boxes of that size epsilon needed. In the matrix notation, you have a matrix where each one of these red boxes is represented by a one, and each one of the grayed out boxes is represented by a zero. If we then just sum up all of the entries of the matrix, that's this line here, we'll get the number of boxes needed of that size epsilon to cover the trajectory. This is precisely the function you needed for part one of the homework. With the function I just showed you, you can now answer questions A through D. If you run this code using an epsilon of 0 0.05, using an XZ projection of the trajectory located at the link in this homework, you get that it takes 13,968 boxes. Part B asks, would this point, that is log one of that epsilon over log of n of epsilon, be in the scaling region of a log n epsilon versus a log of one over epsilon plot for this trajectory? And the answer to this is no. All points are covered by approximately their own box. If you look at the length of this time series, or the length of this trajectory, it's 14,000 points long. The fact that there's 13,998 boxes means that basically every point has its own box. Most likely this point would be on the top flat curve, not in the scaling region. For part C, we instead use an epsilon of 0 0.5. In this case, we get that we have 4,342 boxes. Part D asks the same thing as part B, but instead, epsilon is 0 0.5. Since we had 14,000 points in the trajectory, and we had 4,342 boxes, it's most likely the case that this point would be in the scaling region. Certainly, all points are not covered by a single box. They're covered by 4,342 boxes. And not all points are covered by approximately their own box. Many boxes are shared. So it is likely that this point would be in the scaling region. However, to show that this is true, you would need to do this calculation for a range of epsilon and plot log of n epsilon versus log of 1 over epsilon and check for a scaling region by hand. 